Welcome everyone to our February webinar of the 2021 class winter uh, webinar series. Uh, while we meet in a virtual platform, we would like to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home. From coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Today we have a, a speaker from uh, the Maya Foundation uh, in Guatemala, uh, Dr. Sofia Paredes. And I would like you, um, I would like to let you all know that you can you can ask questions during the talk on Facebook on the comment section, and we will get to them at the end of Dr. Paredes' talk. And I will pass this on to Amadeo, who is going to give an announcement. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen. So I would like to remind you that we extended the deadline um, to, to submit uh, papers to class notes, uh, our journal. Uh, so as you can see here, we have uh, three different formats. We have abstracts, we have field notes, and we have articles, so different lengths um, of, uh, of the, for different types of submissions. Uh, and uh, I would also like to remind you that you need to be a class member to, uh, to submit um, a paper to class notes and uh, on Facebook and on, uh, our, uh, and on our website, you will find all the information on how to, all the information how to submit a paper and uh, on the template that you need to use. So check out the Facebook page and the website to, to have more information about that. And uh, now I will let uh, Kara introduce our speaker uh, and uh, then uh, and she will uh, let our speaker talk and present uh, on her research. Thanks so much, Amadeo. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are. We're very, very excited that we have Sophia with us today from La Ruta Maya Foundation. She has some incredibly important work and has published some incredibly great stuff and worked with some great organizations as well. So Sophia has a BA in archeology span from the Universidad del Val de la Guatemala. And she has two masters, one in museum studies and one in Caribbean and Latin American studies both from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at New York University. And Sophia has carried out research on looting of archaeological sites in rural communities and also gum extraction camps in the Maya Biosphere Reserve. And she's also worked with the Copan Archaeological Park and a wide range of cultural and heritage organizations throughout Guatemala. And she also has a vast range of museum experience. So as well as being the executive director of the La Ruta Maya Foundation, she has interned in the conservation department at the Met in New York. She's been a consultant for uh, Tikal National Park, the Morley Museum there. She's worked in the education department at the American Museum of Natural History. So she really does have a very wide range of experience. So we are very grateful that she is talking to us today live from Guatemala with the wonderful collection behind her and we're very excited for a talk so please do ask any questions throughout the talk either on Facebook live or if you're joining us on zoom you can type in the chat or ask questions at the end and so I will pass it over to Sophia so she can share her screen and start her talk. Thank you very much, Cara. So I will start right away. Greetings to everyone from Guatemala, the land of the Maya and the land of eternal spring. Okay, so here we are. Uh, welcome everyone. It is uh, a very good opportunity for me to talk about uh, a topic that is controversial, but it's also necessary and is the protection and dissemination of cultural heritage that, that does not have archeological context. I will give some uh, information before 
about before talking about La Ruta Maya, uh, it is very important to know what is going on with the archaeology and, and our territory. As you know, uh, Guatemala is in the is one of the five countries that are that belong to Mesoamerica, and it, we are in the center, so we are like the heart of the Maya land. Guatemala has 14 life zones with constant occupation since pre-Columbian times and a growing population that is always inhabiting the areas that were inhabited before. So we are now a layer, an additional layer on top of the previous occupations in the region. Thousands of archeological remains are destroyed and depredated uh, because we are in a land that is very rich and uh, of course, uh, there is a lot of uh, um, pre-Columbian evidence and also paleontological evidence in the area. And we have to uh, talk about also the period of greatest looting in, at least in Guatemala, but also in most of Mesoamerica was between the 1960s and the 1990s. Uh, most of it started because uh, the art of this region, of the Maya region, but also in, for all Mesoamerican art, started with the first research reports and the first exhibitions on big museums. Now, something that I want to stress out is how does local people have access to archaeological heritage? Most of our countries here, uh, people are associated to archaeological heritage either by tradition, and a ritual that happens with Native American groups here. Uh, a a pre-Columbian object is considered the object of the ancestors. Eh, los objetos de los ancestros, la, las piezas de los abuelos, the objects of the grandmothers and grandfathers. Uh, but in the Western way of thinking, all these are antiquities from previous groups. That's how we look at them. So how does local people have access to archaeological heritage and how they view these kind of objects? First of all, there are five ways in which people have access to this heritage. And it's important to note because the term object without archaeological context is not necessarily only the objects that are associated to looting by destruction. Of course, we are against looting by destruction. If the object loses any kind of information that it might give as part of the big, um, a, uh, the big picture or the mosaic of the history of the place, of the site, of the country and of the region. But if there is also uh, this, context, this contextualized object because of other reasons that we also have to pay attention. The first one is the destructive looting for commercialization. That is the most um, uh, common for us to hear of looters uh, breaking inside temples or inside pyramids or inside tombs and extracting everything for sale. But we also have, yes? Sorry to interrupt. We don't see your screen yet. Not sure if you wanted to start sharing yet or not. Well, I was sharing according to me. Um, oh, that, that's, that's strange. It was not sharing? We don't see it yet, no. We weren't huh. sure if you the introduction or you wanted to start sharing. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought I was sharing. Sorry for that. Okay. I was, I was just introducing this part. Perfect. Yeah, we see, we see your screen now. Okay, you see it. Okay, yeah. should I let me know if it's sharing? Yes, that's great. Yeah, we okay. see. Okay, I am so sorry. sorry Technical problem. <laughs> well, this is our region, I was telling you. I'm sorry about that. And this is where I am right now. We have the destructive looting for, for um, commercialization, but we also have fortuitous discoveries due to the intensive and extensive agriculture and also plot agriculture. Uh, as I was telling you, Guatemala is so rich in all the environments. We have previous settlements 
that is very common for people to find things while they are doing agriculture. We also have to consider the extensive agriculture means plantations and the removal of, of uh, earth and land uh, that uh, provides many of the objects. Also, we have fortuitous discoveries during urban planning, construction of roads, uh, and even domestic uh, repairs at home and construction of houses. People find objects uh, as we will see uh, further uh, on in, in this chat, in this uh, uh, conference. Finding during extraction of geological resources like mining, for example, or uh, quarrying, uh, it's also very common to find archeological remains. And believe it or not, we also have the chances of finding objects while doing sports, caving, diving, and hiking. Why I mentioned this? Because caving, caves were considered one of the entrances to the underworld in the Maya and Mesoamerican a cosmovision. So it's very easy for someone doing caving or going as a tourist inside to find objects that were left there as um, offerings. Uh, and they are still, many caves are still being used today by current Native American groups as ritual places. The same happens with forests. There are some forests that are bosques encantados or magic forests in some regions. The crosses of four roads, the four, four the cruces de cuatro caminos are also considered a, 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 a sacred. And in many places that have a, a sacred sites, there are natural areas that are considered sacred to Native American people uh, we have volcanoes, we have caves, we have lagoons, and uh, spring uh, water springs, for example. So when some people are doing any of these sports, it is very probable they will uh, stumble upon this kind of, of uh, heritage. Here to my right, you will see uh, murals from the time of the European contact in, ha in houses in Chajul Quiche. This is a photograph from National Geographic. And in Guatemala, uh, there are archaeologists doing research on them. Uh, people that were doing repairs at home and they washed the wall of the kitchen and a mural of Spaniards with people dressed with jaguar skins were found interacting together and it's not only one house it is it, at least at least 13 houses and people still live there local people and they were amazed of what they were finding uh, and this is one example of what i am talking about and we are going to talk about a little of what's uh, going on in in the region this is one example of the destructive looting I was talking about uh, the breaking inside temples or breaking inside tombs to obtain objects for illegal trafficking. Usually this is combined with other illegal uh, activities like poaching and uh, drug trafficking. For, they use the same routes today. But I, this photograph was taken in the 1990s before the signature of the peace agreements in Guatemala. But we have to say that the armed conflict was very difficult here for many reasons, including the um, systematic uh, destructive looting in order to take objects for in international illegal trade. Um, in these cases, the physical destruction of archaeological sites and the surroundings is, is, uh, ob is obvious but also the destruction of historical, social, and environmental information. And summing everything up, also the local population who was engaged in looting, the first levels, were also in risk of their lives because of collapse of trenches, because of fights among, among people who were 
uh, destroying, etc. For Trisha's findings uh, from agriculture, uh, here we have an example. There is a, a book um, uh, that mentions what was happening in, in Rio Negro, in the highlands of Guatemala. And there is a, a jaguar that was found in a plot of land by a local man who was working in his milpa, and he found a jaguar coming down the stairs of a temple. And now we see it is exhibited at the National Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology of Guatemala. And uh, it, these situations are very, very common in the highlands uh, and everywhere in Guatemala. But one region that is mostly affected is the South Pacific coast of Guatemala, where we have most of the um, agriculture that is related to um, uh, agro industries, large agro industrial uh, companies and plantations. That region that is very, very rich archaeologically is uh, coincidentally the, the most productive region in the country. So we have historically, we have um, a cotton cattle, a sugar cane right now, and then African, African palm. And that is, is, is one big um, situation here in Guatemala. For tuition's findings due to construction, here I have two examples of uh, news, nor normal news in the newspapers, popular newspapers, about people finding objects in their land and asking what to do to take care of them. And in some cases, some of them offering to, to donate the object to a museum so it can be seen by tourism. But people are little by little more aware of what they are going to find. And this kind of material, as I was telling you, are, is an example of how people find objects and why there is a lot of objects without archaeological context. That's something that La Ruta Maya is, has to deal with. Here we have the examples in the two pictures above of the murals uh, from Chapulquiche that we were talking about. You see uh, two other views of how they look like. And then in the pictures below, you will see uh, Guatemala City. That is, we are literally sitting on top of Caminal Huyu, one of the most powerful sites in Highland Guatemala that was in a um, diplomatic and commercial relationship with the highlands of Mexico, Teotihuacan. So you can imagine this was a big site, very important. And now Guatemala City is on top. What you see green on your left is the archeological park of Caminal Huyu. The park is the delimited land that is the archeological park it has a site museum and you have very uh, research going on. But what happens with the rest of the city on top? This is another example of a military watchtower taking advantage of a pyramid in El Naranjo Petén. Uh, this uh, photograph is, this is only one. There are three pyramid mounds uh, in, in row, and the three of them have this thatched construction on top to be used by the soldiers as watch outs. Uh, so this is another situation because on top of finding objects, we also have a situation that is very interesting in Guatemala the use, reuse, and modification of cultural objects, of, of uh, archaeological objects. Uh, use, because in some cases people find things and they use them as in the same way they were supposed to be used before. For example, in the Petén we have the um, grinding stones if a grinding stone is found, obviously it will go to a kitchen, to a modern kitchen, and people will start using it as it was supposed to be used before. In other cases, uh, we have the modification 
of archaeological remains in order to, to be of use today. They can cut slabs and they can uh, use again a, a small pot to put their tortillas in or their corn and reuse the objects. And we also have ritual use. This is one of the most interesting aspects that I like to see and talk about because in contemporary Guatemala, we still have a lot of ritual going on as part of the intangible cultural heritage we have. Guatemala has a, a, a cultural heritage that includes a ritual includes myths, uh, legends, uh, storytelling, and obviously in the, the Maya altars of today will still have performances for the deities, and many of them will include, all of them, will include archaeological objects on the altars. When I was talking to many of these Ahkijab, um, Ahkij is the Maya spiritual leader. Ahkijab is the group of Maya spiritual leaders. I have been um, doing interviews to some of them. How do you find these objects or, or where do they come from? Archaeological point of view, I would like to know from where are they obtaining what I see there. Monuments, you can see big monuments here. And we also see ceramics and, and smaller objects. And they will always say, when it rains, the Lord of Lightning throws the glass fragments, that's the obsidian, los chayas in Spanish, and the white stones that are rock crystals or quartz on the mountain. So we can collect them for the altar. That's how they see how the objects were obtained. Of course, I know that when it rains, probably the mound is washing and that's the, the objects surface from the ground when it's uh, raining. But I am going to tell anything. It's, it's how they find things. And uh, we also have big monuments like this one that we see here. That is uh, Monument 3 in Cotzumaluapa, Escuintla. Uh, people call him El Dios Mundo, El Rey Tecún, Tecún Humán, or simply La Piedra. So this is uh, something that we have to deal as foundation, and that's why I started with that introduction. Uh, the information uh, gets confused because people usually do not know what is cultural heritage what it is for and why is it important in order to take care of it. Uh, this picture I like very much. I, I, I call him the royal pig because he is in one room of a Maya temple that was cleaned up to put the pigs inside as a pig stick or as a pig den. And they are living in a Maya palace, but it's really today a place where to put the pigs. So es el cerdito real, is how I call him. What does the law say and where? Guatemala has a, a long story of legislation that protects cultural heritage. And uh, with the political constitution of the Republic of Guatemala, that says that all the country's paleontological, archeological, historical, and artistic assets that have cultural value are uh, protected by the state and uh, uh, they are property of the state. That is something very interesting here. Also, we have uh, the uh, Lay for the Protection of Cultural Heritage of the Nation. Uh, that one uh, in its articles also uh, comments and establishes what kind of objects and remains and features that are archaeological or paleontological, archaeological and historical are protected by the state and should be protected and have bans on 
uh, trade, uh, illegal exportation, for example, and um, even modifications. Uh, and these objects are also uh, are considered property of the state. So considering these, uh, these are the two basic legislations we have, but there are many others re nationally and regionally for the protection of cultural heritage. En la Ruta Maya Foundation, what we do here, the, we are the only organization in the region that I know that manages to repatriate archaeological objects. And at the same time, we support the rescue of the information, the conservation and preservation of cultural values in order to study them and disseminate and share them with uh, academia, uh, with students and the public in general. Um, why is it controversial? Because it is an organization that obtains its objects mostly and only by voluntary donations. That is very, very important. As we saw in the, in the introduction about what is going on with looting and, and the uh, um, destruction of pre-Columbian remains, it is important to know that the objects that we try to bring back we are absolutely not responsible for them, for the exportation of these objects. We are responsible of bringing back for whatever we obtain voluntarily as a donation. This organization was formed in the 1990s by Wilbur Garrett, who was the former editor of, La, of National Geographic magazine, and Mr. Fernando Pais, who is a um, Guatemalan, uh, who was living in the United States for some time. He was part of his board of directors also. And this original um, organization was formed to support a regional uh, project that was called La Ruta Maya, mostly associated for tourism and a way of creating a fund to promote conservation of uh, archaeological parks, national parks, and museums in Mesoamerica. That means the five countries, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Belize, and El Salvador. Uh, this big um, organization that was regional, uh, La Ruta Maya Foundation was a foundation to uh, promote a fund to create, to accompany this big a project. However, time passed and when uh, Mr. Wilbur Garrett decided that it was not longer a, a, an organization that will be able to fulfill what it was supposed to do because each of the countries created their own um, uh, the tourism the uh, ministries of each country created a Mundo Maya, eh, un proyecto Mundo Maya. So La Ruta Maya eh, finished and this organization was rescued by Fernando Pais with another purpose, with the purpose of what if we could bring back whatever left illegally. And that is the spirit of La Ruta Maya. We fulfill our a mission through five programs. The first one is recovery and repatriation program. We do not bring anything back if it is not donated first voluntarily. Uh, we received it and we cannot bring anything back unless we fulfill all the paperwork and the permits, both from the Ministry of Culture and Customs. As soon as we have the permits, we transport objects uh, back. Uh, also, we have this, uh, another of the programs, the registration and documentation. The entire collection is inventory and registered as cultural heritage of the nation. What the, uh, La Ruta Maya is a legal depositarian 
or custodian of the national heritage. We have registered to date 3,454 objects to date, and in process, we have 164 uh, in the process. Each object has an individual file, uh, physical and digital, that includes the record, the original record of the Registry of Cultural Property of, of the Ministry of Culture, internal database record, photographs, the history of the exhibitions where this object has participated, any restoration and conservation processes, and associated bibliography and publications of similar objects. It's a lot of work, but we have like, like a medical uh, file for each one. In some cases, I like to call them with nicknames, no? It's a nice nickname to, to remember each, each of the objects also. We have the, our local exhibitions program. We, anything that has traveled out of the country for an international exhibition, everything is shown in Guatemala first. And I try to, we don't have a museum, so we try to have alliances with organizations that have this a, a, a similar objective and a, organizations that have um, spaces for cultural dissemination, galleries or smaller mu or, or mu um, accredited museums in Guatemala that gives us the space in order to show uh, ex exhibitions that are usually, um, we have thematic exhibitions. I think the best way we can reach out to the public is presenting objects with a theme or a main topic in order to engage people in something uh, that they can see interesting and uh, also um, uh, compare or associate with their own lives. So here we, I have some photographs of examples of objects, how I make them dialogue with contemporary art, like here, the, the last one here, uh, how I make them dialogue with textiles, if the object has a textile decoration, food and um, banquets, uh, Maya and water, uh, Teotihuacan incensarios or incense burners, and so forth. Uh, when we try to, when we create an exhibition of these objects, we, as, as soon as we receive an object, we try to study them, compare them with archeologically uh, contextualized objects, um, objects from other museums, uh, in a way that we can create comprehensive labels and be able to reach out with the information they provide. We understand most of the objects lost the main part of the information they would give. We don't know who was the owner, if it was associated with another set of, of offerings. We lost that part. We even lost the places where they were made. But there are many ways to analyze an object using different uh, technologies and techniques of investigation or research that we are able to at least be able to say something about them. And when we arrive to the places where we show the objects, it's not only Guatemala City. We, we, we had one huge one in Quesaltenango uh, and th those objects, almost 200, they traveled afterwards to Europe but it was shown before in Quesaltenango in the highlands of Guatemala. And we had a wonderful experience there because a group of Akihab or Maya spiritual leaders went to perform a ceremony to ask permission to be able to show the objects. And that was an awesome experience uh, because they, the objects were talking to them, what happened to them. And they were telling me, this object was used for this and that, that was used for, and I was taking notes because it's the same heritage, it's intangible, but 
everything that is considered Maya cosmovision today, even if we grew up with a, another cosmovision, Western cosmovision, um, Judeo-Christian in our cases, that doesn't mean that whatever beliefs are tangible in an object, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Even if we grew up with another set of beliefs, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So we are very, very respectful of that. Also, we have uh, loans, as I was telling you, to uh, another um, cultural spaces, mostly museums, accredited museums in Guatemala and, and galleries, where we are able to show uh, our exhibits. Internationally, we have traveled um, to several countries uh, in Europe, uh, Central America, and the United States. Very, very uh, well accepted. Uh, and most of uh, our objects have been the face of the exhibition. We always try to stress, when I uh, arrive to any international exhibition, to stress the fact that the object lost archaeological context and why, what are the disadvantages of looting and the disadvantages of knowing the purpose of the original purpose of the objects. We always go with the, with the truth up front and we tell people, these objects were not excavated uh, scientifically, they were rescued, they were returned, and why we try to give them a voice that they lost. Also, uh, another of our programs is uh, research. Uh, we are open for researchers and students to have access to the objects in order to uh, do their academic work and internships. We have uh, received also uh, many volunteers who have helped us in cataloging, filing, conservation, and even identification of uh, shell, for example, as we see here, uh, Julio Cotton here down left, identifying the species of, of uh, the shell shell objects that we have here. Uh, we have received students doing um, research on stamps or seals or uh, certain kinds of uh, stone artifacts, etc. And we also try as much as possible just to share our exhibition, our, our collections via the um, social media. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and uh, I have a, a very nice surprise to tell, and is that we are now working, almost finalizing our new web page because we have had. Oh, this is the third web page that we are having, a uh, fully English and Spanish, uh, a new website much modern, uh, much interactive, but for the first time, we will have the entire collection online. And it's a lot of work, a lot of years, and it, it obviously is going to be updated. And if there is something that is not so good, we are going to fix it. But whatever is um, being worked here is going to be modified on the web. So we will have very, very soon, in a few weeks, I will let you know, Cara, that we will have our collection online. And uh, this, well, is a, a, a small uh, presentation you know, about La Ruta Maya. We are also considering this logo that you see here is not official yet, but I am including it here because in the Guatemalan a section, we will have this new logo uh, that is associated to one of the objects we have, a mosaic jade mask, and that uh, is symbolizing the way of joining together the pieces of history and as a whole, and giving a voice to the object to say something about itself. 
So uh, I am open for questions. You let me know if I stop sharing the, the screen or, or, or what to do before the receiving questions from you. Thank you very much to all. And here I am ready for the questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sophia. We can leave your screen up and then people can take down any information about the okay. website and social media. So we can leave that up if you like, that's not a problem. Thank so um, I'm gonna open it up first to our uh, Zoom participants. If anyone ha on Zoom has a question for Sophia, feel free to take yourself off audio and, and you can ask, or you can pop it in the chat. And uh, Amadeo is gonna have a look at the Facebook chat as well. So uh, I'll give everyone just a moment. If everyone has a question on Zoom, we can start there. Not yet, but I know that we had a question on Facebook. So maybe Amadeo, we can start with the, the Facebook question. Yeah, I can start with that. And uh, Jorge Bueno is asking, where is the most important exhibition of uh, La Ruta Maya right now? Uh, and if you have any exhibition, I would say right now with the pandemic, it might be a bit hard. Well, so. yes, we, we have two exhibitions, one here in Guatemala and another one uh, that is in Cincinnati, um, Cincinnati Museum Center. Uh, you can find information on, on the website of the Cincinnati Museum Center, but in here in Guatemala, I have one uh, that, that is uh, in Antigua, Guatemala, in Santo Domingo del Cerro, uh, that is it's called Obras Maestras uh, del Artista Maya, uh, Masterworks of, of the Maya artist. I understand that because of the pandemic, we have uh, severe problems. It was closed most of the time. In, in August, the Guatemalan exhibition reopened again. And in Cincinnati Museum Center, they inaugurated the, uh, the uh, exhibition in Mar March of 2020. And the last day they had to close. But they reopened in July with protocols and extended the time of the exhibition. So it's going to be until the end of March. Uh, so people who are in the United States, uh, they can go and, and still see it and you can contact the website of the Cincinnati Museum Center. Uh, I will uh, open one in July, also with protocols and special distancing and that because the, the, in, in the, um, in the uh, center, the, the Spanish Center for International Cooperation in, in Antigua, El Centro de Formación de la Cooperación Española. They have a very nice exhibition places where we exhibit our annual exhibition, usually six months, and is about musical instruments, uh, pre-Columbian Maya musical instruments, uh, se llaman sonidos ancestrales. Uh, ancestral sounds, that will be the translation, uh, music of antiquity. Uh, and we will have very interesting objects showing there. And we will, as usual, try to take uh, photographs and have a, a virtual presentation online for the people who cannot travel. But yes, we are, we are trying to be active in, in that place. Consider we don't have a museum, we still move our objects a lot. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you, Sophia. And actually, if anyone is, is here in Canada, especially in Victoria, um, there were a lot of pieces from the foundation last year at the, um, the Royal BC Museum. They had an exhibition on the Maya, which was due to be in Edmonton. And I'm sure at some point- It will be, it's going to be in May. Okay, in oh. Edmonton is going, we are traveling to, uh, it's Alberta yep. and Edmonton. Excellent. So for those of you that are in Alberta, you can see some of the pieces there. And the exhibition at the Royal BC Museum was fantastic. So I encourage you to, to check it out in Edmonton. And it will be a bit warmer in May, less snow. <laughs> yes, that, that's the one who is in, that is in Cincinnati right now. It's going to go up to Canada again. 
Fantastic. Um, so we have a question from someone here on Zoom. Um, for your upcoming online collection, will the photos be released into the public domain with um, a CC license? I don't know if you know that or not. Yes, the idea of La Ruta Maya is showing the collections and make them available for the public. Uh, obviously, at the moment of looking at them on the web, the, um, eh, ¿cómo se le llama? The, the size is going to be enough for web. If someone wants a, a bigger image for publication, they can contact us later. But the idea is for people to be able to, to share the, 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 uh, the photograph and be able to download, of course. That's, that's the main objective. Uh, but for higher resolution, uh, the resolution is going to be not as big, uh, but anyone requiring larger, they can contact us. That's the idea. Fantastic. And then we also had a related question from Heather. Um, are you recording any of your material for the web in 3D? Yes, we have. There is, we had an exhibition about the 16th century Maya idols that of course uh, the, the clergy um, forced local uh, lords to burn them during uh, the first, the, the beginning of the colonial times, 1554, there was an auto de fe here in, in Santiago de los Caballeros in Guatemala, what is now Antigua, and the uh, university, State University of Missouri with Dr. John Chuchiak, we co-curated an exhibition here uh, in Antigua. And the entire collection was about how Maya objects or pre-Columbian objects were considered objects of the devil and they were destroyed. That was another situation of, of historical situation that happened here. And that exhibition was completely filmed and photographed in order to make a virtual 3D exhibition. People are going to be able to manipulate the, the object. We also have had collaborations from students uh, on, students of uh, uh, archaeologist Camilo Luin, who is the curator of the Popol Vuh Museum. He created some 3D examples of some of our objects, and those are the ones that are already going up into our webpage. We know that uh, there are some students and people who want to work on that with objects of the collections, and their collaborations are going to be included also in, in our website, uh, sharing to, to everyone. Fantastic. And I'm sure Heather has plenty of students as well, if you need any more help with that. Yes, we love receiving students here. <laughs> it's a win-win situation, you know. We, we provide the experience of looking at objects that are complete. When I was an archaeology student, I remember I was excavating in the project and I had tons of shirts. And until I was a volunteer, a student volunteer at the Popol Vuh Museum, I was able to see a complete object as a student no, for the first time. So, so I think it's a win-win situation to receive interns. They fulfill their, their academic work and, and we benefit with their work in order to, to add uh, information about the objects and, and using technology, no? Yeah, and related to that, uh, we got a question uh, from Facebook. Ana Luisa Eguizabal is asking if you have an internship program and uh, how you can apply to become a volunteer or an intern, I guess. Yes, you can contact me to the, to, uh, the contact us in our webpage is, is already open. Uh, uh, I am, oh, I forgot to include here my own email, but it is Paredes, as in Sofia Paredes, es Paredes uh, at 
larutamaya.com.gt, as in Guatemala, GT. Uh, you can contact us or in, in the via Facebook, you can also reach me and let me know if you are planning to come. We, we do have some facilities for students to, to be with us and we can also be of assistance for lodging or how to get here or picking you up at the airport if you need. Uh, of course, we, we do have a, a, a program. It's not very big because uh, we have been starting with small groups of students uh, and visitors, but with the pandemic, we are already open with a um, appointment. And anything, uh, we, of course, we, we can receive students here. Yes. Excellent. And I also just um, typed out your email for the Facebook page. And yes, I'm sorry for that. Look at me. It's like Facebook, <laughs> Instagram, and <laughs> not mine. Perfect. Um, there was also another question from someone here on Zoom. Um, has there been any research about whether online access to museum pieces reduces or discourages looting? So I don't know if you, um, yeah, have looked into that or you know of any research about that. I don't know about any research on that. Uh, uh, something that happened uh, historically in our region is that as soon as the big exhibitions, blockbuster exhibitions of pre-Columbian art started to open, at the, uh, in the 20th century, uh, 1970s, 1960s, 80s, when the big exhibition started, it also started the interest in pre-Columbian art. An art that was not seen before as the Greek, Roman and Egyptian art. People turned their heads to see pre-Columbian art. And that was not good. So th there is this situation and there is, has been research on that, on what happened when the big exhibition started, auction houses also started because it is the pre-Columbian art started to be very interesting uh, to collect. And that was unfortunate. Now, showing objects online, uh, depending on how we show them, at least for La Ruta Maya, we always stress out the disadvantages of looting and the disadvantages of destroying the context of uh, the, the object. Uh, most of the information we have is by comparative studies, um, iconography, epigraphers or people who read glyphs that can read what the objects say and sometimes uh, connect with, with former kings or queens because we, we do have those kind of objects. But showing them, uh, it, it, we have to stress out, we have to always mention what is lost when the object is taken and stripped of the context and taken away and commercialized illegally, because a lot of this information is lost, of course. Uh, responding to your question, I have not seen any research on whether showing the objects will diminish. I, it, it was quite the contrary at, at the beginning with the exhibitions, as I told you. Thank you so much for that, Sophia. Um, and I'll also add, Sophia has a, a great chapter in uh, an edited volume that we, we published recently. Um, and, and Adam Sullen uh, also has a, a chapter in that same volume. And he has done some interesting um, discussions about his uh, online collection of um, Zapotec vases, awesome. how that database is actually being used by auction houses to market and sell objects. So I'll, I'll pop it into the chat here, but if anyone's interested, both Sophia and Adam Selim have um, 
uh, wonderful chapters in this volume, The Market for Mesoamerica. So um, I wonder... I would like to add something, uh, if, if I can, about that. There was one moment uh, in, the, in the high, in the high uh, moments of, of looting and illegal trade and auction houses that uh, looters and intermediaries were using the catalogs of auction houses to check what was fashionable uh, to, to get. And that was a very unfortunate situation also. So it's not only the online danger. Well, the, the Met and other museums have their collections online. Is the, the use, it was done by, of them by third parties. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah, this is uh, such an important and interesting discussion. Um, is, is there any uh, other questions either on here or are there any more on Facebook, Amadeo, for Sophia? No, I don't see other questions on Facebook. Okay. I, I saw lots of praise for your talk on Facebook. So every, lots of people are saying thank you, Sophia, for a wonderful Ay, De nada. Con muchísimo gusto. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, I think my, I don't know if you guys can still see me. My screen is black. Um, I can see you. Oh, okay. okay, I can't see anyone, but my, that's okay. It's my, my laptop being strange. Um, oh, I see everyone again. <laughs> so it's probably time to wrap up. My computer's telling us it's time to wrap up. So I think I'll let Amadeo stop recording. Uh, we'll stay around on Zoom for a few moments uh, with you, Sophia. Thank you.